Hi everybody. Uh, today I want to talk about gas exchange in our aquariums and how water circulation and surface agitation impact the gas exchange in our aquariums. But before I do that, I want to get a few things clear so we're all on the same page moving forward. Um, I just shot a series of videos recently where I did some sort of, well, you can call them an experiment, you can call it a demonstration, whatever, um, where I actually reduced the surface agitation in a few of my tanks to almost nothing at all uh, to show that my tanks can function just fine even overnight with very little to no surface agitation. And the whole series of videos stemmed from some comments that were made and the comments sort of gave me the impression that the person had only watched the first minute or two of the video and then quickly jumped to the comment section to tell me I was wrong about something. And that's not that unusual. This is not the first time this has happened. And I often get comments that uh, are indicative of someone who's simply commenting based on the title rather than actually having watched the video. Uh, I do understand that I've got long-winded videos. I do like to give a very thorough understanding of what I'm talking about rather than simply slapping facts on the table. I like to sort of get to the whys and wherefores of how it all works together. I believe that having a deeper understanding of how our tanks function is the key to having more successful tanks. And that's where I'm eventually going to get to with this video. But if you're going to simply watch the first minute or two and make a comment, hey, nice video, I hate your tanks, whatever, that's fine. Um, but if you're going to tell me I'm wrong, you know, at least watch the video. Watch all of the information before you say I'm wrong, because I don't necessarily make a statement that's definitive as a statement in and of itself. Like, you don't need surface agitation in your tank. It's not necessary. Well, that doesn't mean... I never said that it's not necessary in every single situation. I've gone on to explain a little more in depth about what situations are different, so on and so forth. So you can't simply say this is wrong or that's wrong without actually watching all of the information. So having said all that, I also want to make it clear that I'm just putting information out there. I'm not in any way saying this is what you should do in your tank. I say over and over again that every single tank is different and needs to be addressed as it's an individual tank. You can't simply say, well, I saw this guy do that with his tank, so I'm going to do it with mine. And that's why I feel that the deeper understanding is the better approach. You can look at your tank and say, okay, well, now that I understand how this works and now that I understand how this impacts that or that affects this, I can now move forward with whatever changes I want to make or I can try managing my tank differently. I always stress not to do anything radical without keeping very, very close eye on your tank. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not advocating going out and doing stuff based on my experiences. I'm simply sharing my experiences in hopes that it deepens all of our understanding of what's going on in the tank. I'm a rank amateur. I don't have any professional experience at this. I don't have any professional uh, experience or education, you know, no formal education in chemistry or fish keeping or anything like that. Uh, and that's why I refer to these as layman's lectures. These are not, I don't see that as me lecturing to the layman. I see that as I am the layman lecturing to the best of my ability, my understanding of how whatever I'm discussing at the moment works. And in this case, we're going to discuss surface agitation, water circulation, and gas exchange. So keeping all that in mind, moving forward, um, it, the gas exchange process is pretty straightforward. It's just simple diffusion at the water's surface. And the way it works is it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. The amount of dissolved gases in your water are not going to be the exact proportion as they are in the air. But there is a ratio to the amount, you know, if you have more oxygen in the air, more of it's going to move into the water until a certain equilibrium is met. So in your tank, as the fish are producing CO2 and the plants are producing oxygen, the water at the surface is constantly trying to equilibrate between atmospheric gases and the gases that are dissolved into the water in the tank. That doesn't necessarily mean you're adding oxygen. If your plants are producing tons of oxygen, your tank may be releasing oxygen. It's, it's gas exchange is what the important part is. And you want it to generally, under normal circumstances in a low-tech tank, I'm not talking about people who inject CO2 and have high-tech tanks, this is not that conversation. 
but you typically want it to just remain equilibrated with your atmospheric gases for the most part at all times. You will get shifts overnight, you know, based on what's going on, and there's ways to avoid that. But this, that's what's happening. You're getting this gas exchange at the surface. So the water down in the bottom of the tank is going to have a lot more CO2 in it, we'll say, because it's not near the surface. You know, the, the surface water is where all the equilibration is happening. So you need to move that water from the bottom of the tank to the top of the tank. The deeper the tank is, the bigger the disparity is going to be. You know, the more CO2 is going to be at the bottom of the tank versus, you know, up towards the top where you've got a more equilibrated level. So circulation is key here. My tanks that I just did this experiment on have a lot of circulation. I know it doesn't look like it, but I've got a 650 gallon per hour power head in this tank. And then, of course, the filter and spray bar, while they're not disrupting the surface, they're still moving a lot of water. And I still have them angled downward. So they are pushing water that's near the surface down into the tank, which forces water that's down in the tank to come up. And I get that turnover at the surface and that's where I'm getting my gas exchange. Uh, that's sort of the nutshell version of it. Now if we're going to get into surface agitation that's a different story. Surface agitation actually increases the amount of gas exchange exponentially depending on the amount of surface agitation you have. If you've got say a hang on the back filter and you've got like the wavy ripply water that's coming out of the filter that's I don't really think of it as agitation until you see white water I'll say it splashes bubbles you know you gotta have either a waterfall effect coming off your hang on the back or your spray bar has got to be above the water squirting down into it uh, and then of course the ultimate would be the air stone uh, and we'll get to the air stone in a moment but that's you know, whatever you call the ripply water, whether you call that surface agitation or not, that ripply water that's coming out of there, you're actually increasing your surface area when you do that. If you think about it, point A to point B, if you draw a straight line between them and then you draw a wavy line between them, the wavy line is going to be a longer line if you stretched it out. So that, that equates to more surface area. The more surface area you have, the more gas exchange you get. When you get into the kind of surface agitation that I think of as agitation, where you've got like bubbling and splashing, now it's just you're just folding gases into the water. You're just pulling, you know, you're, you're pulling gases right into the water with the bubbles and the, the splashing water. So now you've greatly increased the amount of gas exchange that's happening. And then, of course, when you do the air stone, it's just hands down, there's no way that you're going to get any better gas exchange that's happening in your tank. So the question becomes, do you need it? And my answer is, I don't know. I don't know what your tank is or how your tank is set up. I honestly can't tell you why my tanks don't need it. I've just never bothered with it. I've set them up from day one. Maybe it's the fish that are in there. Um, don't need a lot of oxygen. I know I've got the uh, anabantoids in there, the, the gouramis, who can, we'll say, breathe atmospheric air to an extent. Um, but none of the other fish in there can, and they're all fine. I even have a hillstream loach in there, which is a fish that's supposed to be in fast-moving, high-oxygen water. Now, I had many loaches, you know, many of those hillstream loaches didn't make it. I bought quite a few of them, and I finally gave up because they never lived. This one has. So I consider that sort of the anomaly. I don't think I have enough dissolved oxygen in this water or enough vigorous circulation to keep the fish alive that really do need a high oxygen level. So that's something about, you know, that fish notwithstanding, my tanks are definitely not the kind of tanks that you can put a fish that has high oxygen requirements in it. That's just something I know and something I avoid because my tanks don't have really high oxygen levels in them. Um, I've talked about how overnight your uh, CO2 levels will increase and your oxygen levels will decrease. If you've got a planted tank like mine, the, the plants actually start using oxygen up. But your fish's metabolism slow down as they go to sleep, and as the oxygen levels in the tank reduce, the fish's metabolism reduce as well. They're cold-blooded animals. So I don't necessarily know when it becomes critical. I've talked to people who have said that you know they turned their filter off 
by accident or on purpose or whatever, and within hours they had fish dying and gasping at the surface. You know, that's a different scenario than what I did. I never turned my filter off. I simply reduced the surface agitation. And I also have the power head in my tank. So even though I'm not splashing water on the surface, I'm moving the water around my tank vigorously. I know this is not going to be the equivalent of running a simple air stone. If I had a simple air stone in there, I'd be doing 10 times the amount of gas exchange as I would with my big power head in the back and all that stuff going on. It's all apparently, obviously, we're looking at the proof positive that it's clearly enough to keep my fish alive. Uh, for years on end, the tank has been set up like this. But it still doesn't change the fact that if I had an air stone in there, I'd be doing tenfold the amount of gas exchange. That's just all there is to it. But is that necessary? And that's what my video was about. This all stems from a video where I originally talked about you could run a tank without a filter on it at all if you set the tank up properly. And if you knew what you were doing and you took all the proper steps and you understood the gas exchange process and circulation and so on and so forth. And then this person simply challenged me to remove my filter from my tank and see what happened. Well, you know, that's not what I said in the video. I didn't say you could simply remove a filter from the tank. And that's what I mean. You can't take a little piece of information and say, well, that's wrong without listening to the larger scope of what I'm saying. So you can set a tank up without any actual filtration in it, as long as you've got enough water circulation, or if you didn't have much water circulation, you'd simply have to increase surface area. You'd have to have a shallower tank, and you'd have to have it wider and longer, you know, more surface area, and less depth of water, because you're going to need that gas exchange to happen down deeper with lower circulation. If you've got more circulation, you can have less surface area. So... Surface agitation isn't necessary, and that's all the point to my video was. I didn't say you never need it or, you know, you're wasting your time by doing it. I simply said it's not always necessary. In some tanks it is necessary. In mine it's not. But that's the important part is you've got to look at your tank and understand what's going on how much circulation do I have in both cases that I you know the people that talked to me about how their fish were dying after their filters shut off uh, the one said that they had a heavily planted tank and they think that had something to do with it the other person said they didn't have a very heavily planted tank and they think that had something to do with it I don't know. I know in the one case the guy said he had no other source of circulation so when the filter stopped the tank went stagnant so obviously the fish were suffering very quickly after that uh, and then the other person, the person who originally uh, said I was putting bad information out there, I never know, I, you know, they, they never got back to me so I don't know whether or not they had any other additional circulation in their tank or not. But I do, I've set my tanks up with lots of vigorous circulation in there for that reason. I like to keep the water moving around so I don't need to have splashy bubbles in my tank. I don't like a lot of surface agitation, it annoys me. I hate seeing bubbles in fish tanks and I hate hearing splashing, rippling water in my basement. It annoys me, it's disconcerting. I don't know if something's leaking somewhere. I don't know if a pipe is broke. I just don't like hearing splashing water in my basement. So I keep very still surfaces on my tank. But I accommodate for that by having big power heads in all my tank and I have them angled so that they're pushing down and moving the lower water that's deeper in the tank more towards the surface. So I don't know if that really was a video about surface agitation and water uh, circulation or if it was a video about me doing videos but for whatever that was worth uh, take that for what it was I certainly welcome any comments in the bottom uh, again if anyone really does watch the video and then still feels that I'm putting misleading information or bad information I welcome the comments you know I welcome that conversation again I always say that's how we all you know advance in this hobby I'm by no means an expert and have tons and tons to learn so if that's how you feel then by all means say so uh, just don't watch the first two minutes of it and then jump on me and tell me I'm putting bad information out there. You know, listen to everything I've got to say and then, by all means, uh, question me. So, thanks again for watching this one. That one really did feel like I sort of wandered around in circles. And I apologize for that. Uh, for those of you who enjoy my rambly, wandery videos, you're welcome. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, please go ahead and do so. That way you won't miss anything I've got coming up. And I am working on a few things, as usual. I'm always working on something. And uh, I do lots of different types of video, not always these long-winded rambly ones. So if you're subscribed, you won't miss any of them. 
and you don't want to miss any of them because they're all good. So thanks for watching this one, and I will see you real soon on the next one.